now recording. Um, welcome to the Open Tracing Specification Council meeting, everybody. Good to see all your lovely faces. Um, uh, we've got a fun presentation today uh, from uh, Jonathan Caldor and Michael. Boy, can I not pronounce your last name. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great uh, name, too. Bevelock <laughs> will from a long line of can't pronounce your last names, great family tree. Uh, but uh, it'll be on uh, tracing at Facebook. And uh, rather than uh, ramble on myself, I'd love to uh, let Jonathan and Michael introduce themselves and then uh, kick it off. So welcome. Uh, hi, so yeah, as said, I'm Jonathan. Um, I used to work on the Canopy team on Facebook. I recently um, moved to another team. And, um, and so uh, Michael recently joined the team as well. And so we're using this also as an opportunity to kind of like um, move me off of the uh, advisory board and move Michael onto the advisory board as well. Um, and so yeah, Michael. <laughs> hi, I'm Michael. Uh, I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, no. So I'm Michael. I, I, uh, I just recently joined Facebook and, and the Canopy team. Uh, before that, I was actually at Comcast for a while, um, but actually worked on one of the things I worked on there was actually our sort of internal tracing system as well, um, you know, which was which was the sort of x tray Zipkin, you know, Dapper style one. So I've kind of got, a, you know, some experience with, with uh, both worlds, so, uh, which is kind of interesting. So, uh, yeah. Cool. So, um, yeah, let me attempt to share a screen, which is like the last frontier in giving a presentation over the internet. Um, and so can everybody see this? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna be talking about Canopy, which is Facebook's uh, distributed tracing and analysis system. Uh, this is kind of an amalgamation of a couple of talks. Um, we published a paper in SOSP 2017 last year. Um, two of our engineers talked at QCon in New York. Um, and we're focusing this mostly on the uh, instrumentation and representation of um, Canopy. We'll talk a little bit about um, some of our distributed, um, or some of our um, trace analysis and trace analysis pipelines. Um, and so we'll be happy to sort of like talk more about that, but we're kind of focusing on the um, representation side. So um, yeah, Canopy is uh, an umbrella term, but um, um, for uh, a wide set of things for tracing at Facebook. Um, it encompasses both our uh, single and cross system uh, tracing, our single and cross system analysis. Um, we have instrumentation available in a number of languages, uh, C, C++, Python, Java, and um, because Facebook PHP. Um, other languages are sort of supported through uh, C or C++ bindings. Uh, our instrumentation is integrated into uh, both our like common RPC stack that's shared across all services. Um, it's integrated deeply into our www stack. Um, so the um, overall page load process, both on the client and the server, uh, as well as some other common pieces of infrastructure. Um, and then we're also sort of able to ingest data from other sources. So we have uh, tracing in our mobile applications um, via um, uh, Profilo, I think is the, uh, the name uh, that we open sourced it under. Um, and so we're able to ingest data from there and incorporate it into um, other traces through our backend systems. Um, it also combines an extraction and processing framework. And so given a trace that we receive from uh, some source, uh, we're able to run custom user code to extract trace patterns, um, information from a trace, write them to data sets that we can then do aggregate analysis on. Um, and then there's a separate team that works on performance visualizations. And so they work on um, both single trace and aggregate visualizations for these traces. Um, great. <laughs> uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> 
Um, so can people see this again? Or for, for a hot second. Yeah, PowerPoint is not happy with screen sharing. Um, okay, I'm just going to share the whole desktop and hopefully um, we won't get infinite recursion with the preview windows that also pop up. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Canopy is a little bit different than um, sort of other like span-based tracing systems. Um, we're an event-based system that we then in our back end will take those events and parse them into a higher level model. Um, because we're not span based, we also sort of have explicit edges between points. Uh, we still enforce that the overall structure must be a DAG, so we don't allow any edges that go backwards in time. Um, but otherwise, you can have sort of like edges between arbitrary points within your trace. Um, and then we also have sort of metadata that every other um, tracing system has. Uh, we've sort of layered types on top of them, and I'll talk a little bit more about what this means later. Um, so this is what our overall model uh, looks like. Um, we have sort of five basic objects in um, our trace. We have the overall trace that encompasses everything. Um, a trace is broken up into a number of execution units. Um, in a like explicit manner, an execution unit represents a sequence of, um, uh, or a sequence of trace data that comes from a single clock. Um, in practice, this usually represents either a single host or a single thread within that host, um, but it can be used for modeling other um, primitives as well. Um, within an execution unit, an execution unit contains a number of blocks. Uh, these are sort of the closest analog to spans. Uh, a block represents some duration of time. Uh, it contains a start point and an end point, and then um, zero or more other points that may occur within the trace. Um, and then a point is just sort of an instant in time that captures um, some single uh, instant. Uh, and then edges connect two points together. Um, and so then all these objects can also have sort of arbitrary metadata attached to them. Um, and so I said that we're, we're an event-based uh, uh, tracing model that we parse into a higher level model in the back end. And so uh, here's an example of uh, what I mean by this. Uh, Suppose we have a simple case with four events. Uh, this is sort of the classic RPC call and response events. Um, these sort of get, um, you know, we have a call to a receive on some uh, backend service. That backend service sends some response, and then the parent uh, service gets a, or records a complete event when it received the response from uh, the RPC call. Um, we're then sort of, uh, we take these events and interpret them as, okay, there's some parent block that the, the call and complete uh, are part of. Um, they call to some other uh, service, which is generating a block at the start and the end. Um, and then those are all both within some sort of execution unit as well. Uh, and so this is the base original instrumentation that we've had. Um, we've since extended these events over time uh, as we've added new model elements. And so as we introduce execution units, um, and explicit edges. Um, we've, introduced, uh, we've introduced events that allow users to create these within the, the trace themselves. Um, so one benefit that we get from uh, having this decoupling of events from the actual model uh, is that we're able to update cross-system instrumentation uh, without having to uh, carefully arrange releasing instrumentation versions to both services at the same time. Um, in practice, given you know, service release schedules, it's impractical to assume that the instrumentation version on both sides of the boundary are going to be the same. So you need to have some compatibility across the boundary. Um, and so this decoupling allows us to say, interpret events on one side of the boundary differently um, if we update the instrumentation, while keeping the in instrumentation on the other side the same. 
Uh, and so then this allows us to handle sort of all combinations of cases where service A and service B may either have old or new instrumentation or potentially even different instrumentation entirely. Um, so coming back to the explicit edges, uh, this is probably the like biggest single difference between um, an, a span based model and our model. Um, all of these things can technically be represented within spans. Um, we found the benefit of having explicit edges, meaning that we haven't needed to um, change the structure to add additional, change the structure of the trace to add additional features. Um, and so for this, I can walk through like one example that we have in our current system. So uh, we trace through browsers, um, you know, which includes both the client side uh, JavaScript that's executing, uh, as well as the PHP running on the server. And so, you can imagine some sort of JavaScript execution unit, which is recording all the JavaScript that executes on um, in this particular page load. Um, and so there's actually three separate hierarchies that can occur within, or three separate causality hierarchies that can occur within um, the trace here. So you can have the, the sort of standard one, which is your JavaScript is making some sort of remote call in this case, fetching a resource, and then at some point that resource will return and JavaScript is able to use it. Um, however, we also have a second causality hierarchy, which is the function hierarchy. And so, um, you know, the function call stack sort of represents here are, um, you know, relations between parent functions and the child function that they invoke. Um, and so we found that, you know, this is useful for sort of representing nested blocks. So you can have one block that is, um, entirely contained with inside the execution of a parent block. Uh, and we're able to use edges to sort of say that um, this child block is part of this parent block um, without sort of having to represent it as the parent function is making an RPC call to the child function, which is occurring within the same thread. Um, the third causality is actually an interesting one and it occurs in like, I guess more and more languages over time, but like, um, JavaScript and other continuation based languages. And so here you can imagine our schedule function um, queues up some future that will then be executed later on. Um, and so in this case, like our causality isn't necessarily between the root functions that we're executing. Um, but in this case, we've scheduled some function and then we have some, you know, common infrastructure stack, which is executing these um, or pulling these entries off of the queue and executing them later. And so we need to connect to the actual function that we're executing instead of say the parent process function, uh, because that may also be calling other futures that are not actually connected to the one that we scheduled. Um, and so like these are sort of all, you know, parent child relationships ish. Um, but what we found is like they represent different, um, you know, different parent child relationships. Um, and having edges and specifically types for those edges allow us to say that the function, um, the function hierarchy relationship is different than the RPC hierarchy relationship is different from the continuation hierarchy relationship. Um, so one other example where we found like having the ability to create explicit edges has been useful um, is representing application flow. Um, one of the like, uh, common tools for understanding our traces is uh, critical path analysis, particularly for browser traces. Um, and so we ran into a problem where um, we end up with, say, our JavaScript requesting a couple of resources, um, and our JavaScript thread tends to be fairly busy. Um, and so we would get traces that look like this, and we wouldn't necessarily know which resource fetch is on the critical path. Um, and you could actually argue that you know, either one of these is potentially the resource fetch that is blocking. Um, however, if we have additional information from our application, say, when we actually end up using these resources, uh, we can actually see in this case that we use resource two immediately, but resource one, we actually don't need for some, you know, non-trivial amount of time. Um, and so we could have actually delayed resource one significantly without affecting our overall time, but it looks like resource two is actually our blocking resource. And so in this case, we wanna represent some sort of application flow that says, we've received this resource or this result of this RPC call, but we don't actually need it for some period of time. Um, and we should take this into account when we're actually computing the critical path. 
And so here, when we're computing the critical path through resource one, we can say that there's actually a slack in the critical path corresponding to the length of this required for edge. Um, this has also allowed us to experiment with different representations of um, application application based logic. Um, so, for instance, we've also experimented with saying that um, you know, certain events must happen uh, in order for other events to even be considered. And so, um, again, in the page load process, there are some synchronization points where we know that we won't receive, we won't process a receive event until some other synchronous event has happened. And so, uh, we can say that this synchronous, this synchronous event is going to be blocking anything before it. Um, and so, it's a prerequisite for anything else that happens afterwards. Um, so coming back to our metadata, uh, we have sort of the standard uh, string string annotation map um, that's common among you know, a lot of tracing platforms. Um, these can be attached to any object in the trace. Uh, so points, edges, uh, blocks, execution units, or trace, all of them have a metadata object associated with them. Um, we've made a distinction between what we call core custom and error properties. Um, and so there are separate types and separate maps for each one of these. Um, the distinction's a little bit fuzzy between some of these, um, but effectively a core property is something which is um, used by our backend to interpret the trace. And so for instance, the type of an edge is a core property. Um, this also allows us to distinguish between annotations that users add and annotations that we absolutely must have for um, you know, loading or displaying the trace. Um, custom is then sort of a general bucket for any, um, any trace data or any annotation data that users add through their own instrumentation. Um, and then error properties are typically used for um, noting errors in trace construction as opposed to errors in um, the overall execution of the trace. And so for instance, we might use an error to indicate that um, the trace instrumentation never closed a particular block. Uh, versus like uh, an RPC call returned a particular error. Um, the other feature that we have is uh, typed counters. And so they're an explicit separate type from the string uh, annotation map. Um, and so these are counters that have uh, a numerical value associated with them, uh, a particular type, and then also a precision. Uh, and so this allows us to say things that um, like 1,024 bytes is distinct from 1,024 milliseconds, which is distinct from 1,024 kilobytes. Uh, but it does allow us to say that if the user records 1,024 bytes in one place and one kilobyte in another place, um, those two values are actually equivalent. Um, we've also extended it over time to uh, more types as we've needed them. Uh, and so we've introduced uh, sets of strings that can sort of be appended to over time. Um, we've used this in particular on say like execution units or traces, uh, and then also for uh, stack frames. So capturing either like sampled profiling data or um, the stack frame at a particular RPC call. Um, so coming back to, I guess, putting this all together in between like the metadata and our events, um, we've run into, I guess, some fun challenges in modeling. And so, um, Going back to our old instrumentation where we just had a call, receive, response, and uh, complete events, um, each of these has some associated metadata with them. Uh, and one problem we ran into was, well, when we wanted to extend this to um, you know, blocks and points and execution units, um, a call event now does more than just create an edge. Uh, a call event actually ends up creating a point and an edge to uh, the RPC service that you're calling to. And so there's an open, there's a question of um, where does the metadata actually apply to? Like, does that metadata apply entirely to the point that it creates? Does it apply entirely to the edge that it creates? Um, is there a mixture between? Um, we sort of made the decision that a call represents the edge and the point is sort of a like side effect of that. And so the metadata gets applied there. Um, but this does mean that, you know, when users are using the old instrumentation, uh, they can't actually attach metadata to the original calling point instead. Um, and so this is why we sort of extended the instrumentation over time uh, to allow more places for this metadata to apply. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Michael. Um, 
I don't, do you want to try sharing um, your screen instead or do you want me to walk through the slides as you talk? All right, uh, let's see. That's, that's like, a, I feel like this, this is dangerous either way. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll give it, I'll give sharing my screen a shot. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Where do we get it? Is there the green thing? Where's the green thing? Oh, the one, oh, literally the one I'm hovering over. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. Did, did anything good happen on the other end? I, yeah, I can't believe it worked. All right. Okay. Let's, let's just, mm. All right. So, <laughs> thanks. So, so yeah, we kind of pick up from, uh, what's that? Oh yeah. Presenter mode. I know how to use PowerPoint, everyone. <laughs> oh, no, oh, don't do that. Oh, uh, man. Disaster averted. All right. <clears throat> Great. So, so yeah, to kind of pick up from where, where Jonathan left off, um, you know, it was kind of interesting before I, before I, I came here, you know, I worked with, uh, we had a, well, we've open source, Comcast has open sourced it, but uh, a, uh, you know, a very span based, uh, sort of a span based tracing system. We called it money as in like follow the money. And then we had all these like clever things around it. Like the money bank was where all the traces lived and stuff. So it was fun. Um, but the, you know, we, we did run into like some of the modeling issues that Jonathan was, was talking about and actually two in particular that like we, we kind of ran into there and then read the canopy paper and then I quit and came here. Um, but like, you know, that we were like, Hey, this, this could actually be useful were, um, you know, one is we had these sort of situations where, <clears throat> uh, we had a trace on a particular system and, you know, a bunch of stuff is going on in the system when we just wanted to, to sort of attach like a profile of what was happening on that system at, at you know, various levels um, to the trace. Um, and, you know, kind of the best way we could think of to do that in the sort of span based model was you would have a, a sort of a top level span that represented like the entire scope of the execution and you sort of start profiling and then end profiling when that thing closes and, and try and attach that profile to that top level span. Um, but then it was kind of like interesting. You had to know that span was kind of like special, right? Like that was the one that that like had the profiling information, right? And it wasn't that bad, but it was actually kind of clumsy as far as the, the tooling we were building around it went. And in, in sort of the, the canopy model, it's actually kind of more natural to just annotate the execution unit that represents the, that like request handling, right? Because we use that to sort of naturally represent, you know, here's the entire uh, span of uh, processing a, an individual request, um, but not span in the tracing sense. Um, and another interesting one was if you just had to put some work in a queue and you wanted to understand, you know, how long it was in there, uh, right, and, and when it came out, you know, uh, the, that's actually pretty naturally modeled by an, uh, another execution unit um, with points for in queue, DQ, and edges for causality, right, whereas, like, if you sort of put it into, you know, um, you could model that as a separate span and the start, you know, starting into the span or when it goes into and out of the queue, but it, it sort of means a very, very different thing than like most of the other spans that do where it's like an actual RPC graph. Like it's like, oh no, you just have to know, you know, as far as your tooling and stuff goes, it's like, oh, well that particular span happens to be one that represents like this thing sitting in a queue for a while. Um, so, so those are a couple of things that we actually did struggle with from a modeling perspective that we, we were actually pretty interested in uh, when we read the canopy paper to, to sort of help us out with. So, you know, just kind of worth noting, it was, it was kind of a, an interesting thing to, to sort of see it from one side and now start to see it from the other. <clears throat> uh, so, so that said, uh, I wanted to sort of move on a little bit to, to talk a little bit about what we're, we're doing now and sort of where we're focusing. Um, you know, I, I guess Facebook's probably grown quite a bit in, in the past, you know, X years. And um, we've got a ton of engineering teams Right, so one of the things we're focusing in on is getting, getting the, the backend APIs that uh, you know, Jonathan alluded to into a point where um, they're safe and like clear and usable. Um, so that means for us actually sampling isn't enough. We also need rate limiting and I'll kind of go into that a little bit later. Um, but we also want these sort of somewhat tailored, you know, high quality APIs and instrumentation layers that are for you know backend use cases. Um, right now, we're you know what where we really want to be is where we have just sort of like most of the complexity 
um, in dealing with you know the 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 underlying model is handled in sort of instrumentation layer, and an end user of the system just sort of has like a small set of functions like log a point, right? And, and it just, you know the instrumentation layer just says, oh, okay, well here's the active execution unit, here's an active block, and we'll put a point on it. Or if you do need to put a new block alongside of you know the sort of default one, you can sort of do that in an easy way. Um, you know, so so what we really want to do is just make tracing on on the back end just like really really easy for um, folks that are that are building back end services. The the PHP instrumentation we have that that John had mentioned actually kind of does that to an extent already, um, but you know we sort of expose a lot more of of the underlying guts to to back end folks right now. Um, uh, you know, and then another thing that, that actually ends up being useful for is having you know, sort of different APIs that, that are good for different situations. So, um, you know, one of the things that we did, uh, we we're just working with one of our teams that has some like really, really um, stringent sort of perf requirements as far as you know, memory usage goes and, and sort of, you know, um, they really worry about things like, like thread contention. Um, the, the sort of flexibility of the underlying model is actually gonna let us fairly easily create like a, a fairly tailored, you know, hey, if you need to, if you have a really high performance uh, you know, RPC system and like you don't want uh, things going on behind the scenes that could cause additional thread contention or memory allocation, like use this API. Um, you know, so, so that's one thing. Uh, and then the other thing we're working on is actually a uh, sort of a revamp of, if anybody's read the, the Canopy paper, there's a, they're, I think they're referred to as, um, <clears throat> I think custom extraction functions or something like that, but, but it's essentially a DSL for working with traces that happened to run in our back end. We're we're working on sort of a revamped, uh, you know, expanded version of that that'll run, you know, in on a, in a separate set of processes elsewhere, um, and use, a, you know, and be based on sort of Python rather than this completely custom DSL. So those are really the, the two things we're working on now. Um, that that's actually super important for us because we tend to look at traces in aggregate a lot, um, and we need to sort of compute like summary, you know, information about traces often, right? And and you know. The stuff that's sort of covered in the paper, but I think the way we're going to be doing it is, is you know, going to be different. Um, <clears throat> so on the the safety and API clarity side, like this is kind of a um, this is this is sort of an overview of what the instrumentation stack really looks like for us. Um, at the at the bottom layer, we've got like a layer of syncs that do nothing, you know, just deal with serializing the events that Jonathan mentioned and flushing them somewhere. Um, you know, we have sort of an internal Kafka esque system that you know is used. Um, on top of that, there's a, a trace model um, that really just, you know, represents that, that, that trace model as an object model, um, but doesn't let you do things that don't make sense, right? Like you can't create like a block on a point, for instance, right? Um, but it just makes, it makes it a little bit easier to work with. But, you know, when you do things that they're, you know, when you do things with that model, it'll give you pointers so you can sort of keep reference to them in your code and then flush them, you know, it'll flush things to events, uh, usually, usually right away, but you can do some things to avoid that if you need to. Um, and then on top of that, we've got sort of a set of uh, code that deals with creating instrumentation layers, right? Because we don't want people to have to worry about things like, you know, propagating context either through thread boundaries in their system or, you know, across system boundaries. Uh, we don't want people to have to like understand, really, really understand that trace model deeply and understand which parts are active, right? We just want an underlying instrumentation to take care of that. Uh, we obviously don't want people to have to do their own rate limiting because they won't, and then our system will get, you know, knocked over. So, um, so that's not great. But then the, the the whole idea being on top of that, we've got this this sort of instrumentation kit to build back in instrumentations. We've got a set of instrumentations built on that we are that are either built or we'll be building on top of that. Um, and then what we really want to have most folks leverage is sort of this high level API that really just lets them do like a few simple things, right? And and all of the the more complex pieces are handled by instrumentation, right? Like at the end, at the end of the day, you know, so to lack something more like a logging framework, right? Like you log a point or you create a point and it, it goes into the right place on the trace, right? It goes on the right block and the right execution unit and, you know, and so on. And then, you know, maybe exposing, you know, some, a little bit of additional stuff at that high level that, that, you know, handles like the 80% use case. And then if we need to do something more sophisticated, you know, people would have to go sort of layers down in, in this API stack to do it, um, right? And then, like I mentioned earlier, another another thing that we're we're talking about doing, sort of on top of this, is is creating just a really uh, a really performant um, 
but but much more constrained API um, that sort of just does that RPC trace model for some you know particular use cases. Um, and, and it's kind of nice that like this, the, not only the underlying you know event and object model sort of gives us that flexibility, um, but you know sort of the instrumentation that we've got built up lets us do that too. So. Um, so this is a, a quick overview of the other big chunk of stuff we're working on now, which is uh, actually borrowed from uh, the QCon presentation of two of the other gentlemen in the room, so, Joe, Aaron, Edison. Say hi. Hello. Yeah, yeah, we're 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 good at uh, we're good at video conferences over here. So, um, so. The, so, but but basically, like, like I was saying, this is really a, a uh, domain-specific stream processing engine, right? And and language for processing streams of traces. Um, and if you look at sort of the way that we tend to use trace data, um, we do a bunch of different things with it. One of one of those things is obviously just like looking at an individual trace, which is you know kind of useful if you know which trace to look at. But if you don't even know that. Um, you know, or if you want to compare, um, you know, data in aggregate before and after some event, right? Like, uh, you know, a deployment or something and see what's happened, right? Um, or if you just want to compute, you know, summary statistics off of something that can only be derived from, a, you know, a trace, um, right? You know, we, that, that actually ends up being, I think, a, a more common use case uh, for us than just looking at an individual trace. Um, so, so really what this, so, so yeah, so this is a domain specific stream processing, you know, um, system for, for getting at that sort of stuff, right? And we've, we've got a bunch of things that are built on top of it. Um, at, at a high level, you know, really what it, we've got sort of a configuration based, uh, we've got our, you know, internal configuration system that you sort of put, uh, you know, this Python based, um, you know, DSL into, um, <clears throat> that's run by this, this whole set of sort of machines that will go in and run those on a per uh, sort of use case basis, right? So it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, in the old system that's mentioned in the paper, we kind of ran the, the moral equivalent of this all in sort of one, you know, set of infra that was also doing a bunch of other things. You know, this one, the use case are actually split out separate sort of, you know, uh, chunks of, of machine for different, uh, you know, use cases, different, essentially going back to different like users of the system, right, that are going to be doing uh, vastly different things. So that way we get some workload isolation and they're not stomping on one another. Um, the, the, and then we sort of export summary statistics to, uh, you know, an internal database called Scuba and, and folks, you know, build things on top of that. Um, so, so those are the really the two big things we're working on uh, for the time being. And then, um, Oh yeah, the other important thing about this um, that I didn't mention, which is different from the stuff in the paper, is that this actually does allow us to do sort of ad hoc uh, queries, right? Which was not possible with the old system. So that's super useful if you, especially when you don't even know what you what you're what you're looking for yet. Yeah, I got one more image after that. Yeah. All right, let's let's see. Yes. All right. This is this is the this is the uh, slide I stole from Joe. So. <laughs> Uh, so, so that's the stuff we're working on now. Um, and this is just some stuff that sort of, you know, kind of keeps coming up again and again um, that we're, we're, you know, thinking about. Don't know to what extent we'll actually end up really tackling this. But I think it, they're interesting things uh, that not only I think we're thinking about, but I've sort of seen other folks thinking about too. So I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, but one of them is how do we sort of safely do a more arbitrary context propagation at scale? And, and, and the interesting thing is scale here is actually more the diversity of teams and workloads than sort of the scale of, you know, our overall infrastructure. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of a, and, and I think anybody who's done this at like a big company has almost certainly came across the use case where somebody's like, hey, there's this stuff that'll like magically propagate like this ID around and like, I want that to propagate my session ID. Like, so, you know, the, the notion of having a more, um, abstract way of, of using the underlying right wherever you've got the tracing instrumentation of being able to propagate context through it which I, I know is you know in, in open tracing with baggage and and uh, the paper that uh, you know uh, Jonathan Mace I think wrote like is has some really good stuff in it um, but I think one of the interesting things is like once you open up that capability you know like 
how do you keep people from doing really, really bad things with it and such bad things that you end up having to turn it off is kind of a, an open question. Um, and I think it's kind of worth thinking about, like, is there a difference between, you know, that sort of really common use case of like, hey, I just want to propagate an ID sort of within my system boundaries for some sort of session or something versus the broader, you know, I need some context that really might propagate across a very wide set of system boundaries and, and just in terms of like safety for some sort of context prop. Um, and, and then another one is, uh, which, which Jonathan mentioned earlier, like uh, one of the interesting things that, that I think this does fall directly out of the model, uh, the, the, the sort of canopy data model is that it's actually really, really good at doing single node traces as well. And we get like really detailed traces of mobile clients and dub, 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 and, and folks actually want to get like really detailed traces of their own backend systems, you know. Um, so, but it's like, well, how do you then take that really detailed view of a little piece of the system and working into an overall, you know, distributed trace that that's probably broader, um, you know, you, you sort of create a lot of noise for people that just want that broad view. Um, but then sometimes, you know, the person that's like looking at that really detailed view might want to look at something, you know, a few layers back. So there's actually a couple of different ways that we've talked about modeling that and <clears throat> there's some different things we talked about doing that doing with that in terms of like viz tooling you know and so on but it's but it's actually kind of just uh you know it's kind of an open question of how we actually get like a good solid end-to-end -end trace while still having like these chunks of like really really detailed trace at various parts of the system in there and you know because they really are different things with different audiences um you know so so yeah so those are two of the things that i think we're we're thinking about and you know may or may not um, do anything useful with. Um, cool. So anybody have any questions? <clears throat> that was great. But I don't want to ask on this group because then it's going to take forever. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, Jonathan is available for all questions at any time. So just, you know, <laughs> get him over to yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question about uh, metrics and aggregates, actually. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, obviously you have an event-based system and you're rolling up some amount of aggregates out of that, you know, into your tracing system. But are you doing kind of all metrics extraction based on the system or do you have a, a totally separate metric system? And if so, are you kind of sharing, are you using the tracing system for context propagation? And like, how do those two things relate to each other? Um, so we have, there's an independent um, metrics based system for sort of like operational management. Um, the traces will tend to, the traces can share some of the data from those metrics. Um, there's some caveats usually there where like the metrics captured are system level, but say we want to capture request level metrics within a trace. Um, but we can sort of pull the same like um, overall system CPU utilization things like that. Um, what was the uh, oh yeah and so then that has a separate aggregation piece because they're kind of collecting at some regular interval over hosts um, whereas we're sort of like very fundamentally kind of request base. Um, and then there was a question about context propagation I think. Yes. Yeah, so, well, I mean, it sounds like you actually have things separated between system metrics and then maybe your application level metrics are coming out of the tracing system. But the degree to which you may want to dimensionalize some metrics uh, is that all happening, you know, that context yeah. tends to get propagated in the tracer. I was just wondering how that really. Yeah. So one of the places where there is actually um, overlap is um, if you want to understand, say, the, the overall global efficiency of a particular system, um, and in particular the resources that it's utilizing as a whole, um, you do need to kind of look at the resources captured through traces. Um, that, you know, the trace starts at some particular point, and then you're looking at sort of like, what are the resources used by this particular request, and then aggregating over all of these requests in some sampled fashion to understand. Um, like request-based utilization through the system. Um, we're, we're currently using tracing for that. Um, like this is fundamentally at Facebook, like 
context propagation and tracing are fundamentally tied together um, for better or worse. <laughs> um, and so that's where, like, as Michael said, like, we end up with use cases where people are like, man, I really need to propagate a context. Like, let me turn on tracing. And we're like, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and to that, like, we don't, we don't have a, a decoupled generalized context propagation system. And I think, you know, to that sort of, like how do we do that safely with the number of teams that we have is, is sort of an open sort of a, uh, operational question that, you know, we'll have to think about and see if we can tackle at some point. But, um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you have this many different folks sort of that, you know, um, yeah, it just gets interesting. So. <clears throat> yeah, I hear that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone have anything else? <laughs> so on the safety piece on context propagation, like you, you've kind of given us the problem uh, and I totally understand the problem I've lived through this. Do you have any thoughts on how you're actually going to solve it? Uh, I, I have some thoughts. Although the interesting thing I, I realized I somehow, when I redid these slides, I, uh, I skipped my slide on uh, rate limiting, which is actually the, the important safety piece we're tackling now. Uh, so actually, maybe I'll just go over that really quick. Uh, the, the other big thing we're doing with the API cleanup is we're actually adding pervasive rate limiting and as well uh, after, uh, you know, after the sampling. Um, sampling actually ends up not being quite enough for us because, you know, if somebody's doing a, a coin flip that they expect to be on like a tiny percentage of traffic, like maybe in, in a region that, you know, is being used for like, you know, for some experiment and then suddenly a lot of traffic fails over to there, you know, suddenly you can sort of get this explosion of traffic just because of that. Um, so we're actually adding rate limits on a per trace and the uh, end uh, trace size, um, you know, before we can actually sort of start new traces to, to cover that. So that's actually one important safety piece. Uh, as far as generalized context prop goes, uh, you know, I, I think it's something we've been talking about for a while and, and starting to, to think about. Um, I, I do think that um, opening up a sort of completely generalized system and, and like saying, you know, like any engineering team and an organization of our size is free to like go and attach baggage to this thing is like a non-starter. Um, we have, you know, we've got systems that, you know, that, that are they're extremely memory sensitive where, you know, the, like the, the engineers that sort of own those teams would, um, you know, would sort of rightfully just, you know, uh, say very loud things, um, you know, and then I think if you look at some of the, the safety that safety that was sort of in the, the paper that uh, Jonathan wrote, I don't know if he's around, but, um, you know, essentially it, it comes down to like having a principled way of like, you know, capping the amount of size that the, the amount of data that gets propagated. Um, but then it sort of has this like downside of like, oh, maybe if you really, really rely on a particular piece of data, you know, now it's not there. Um, I, I think to the extent that I've thought it through, I, I do think it's really, really worth uh, thinking about how do you separate out the use case where somebody wants to propagate an ID within their system bounds and then sort of attach metadata to it after the fact that can be processed by like some other system, right? And have it emit that data, but sort of like, then not have that ID cross, you know, be propagated outside of the bounds of their particular, you know, set of systems. And then separating that out from like the generalized context prop, which should be very strictly controlled and really only used for like a specific set of blessed things with like a, a, a decent amount of process around putting things in them up front, right? And like some like, some like set of configurations that like can't be changed outside of like, you know, review by some accountable team. So, you know, to the extent that I've thought through it, like that's sort of where I've landed, but you know, that's just, um, we haven't really, really worked on it heavily yet. So. I've tossed around the idea of like prioritized namespaces mm -hmm. in this, this realm, um, but I haven't actually implemented any of that yet. Yeah, yeah you know, and I, and I think, I think stuff like that, I think is, is you know, it's good. Um, but then I think you do sort of run into, the, at least in our world, we, we kind of run into this thing of like, well, okay, what if, you know, the data in your most prioritized namespace is larger than like the amount of data that like the most, um, you know, sort of the most conservative team is willing to accept, 
you know, so you, you kind of just like need some, um, I think you do need to like sort of really tightly control like, um, you know, the, the generalized thing and then try and figure out how to build the, the more, you know, hey, if you want to do something within your own system bounds thing on the same, you know, context prop, but, you know, so I think, I think really ha the notion of having like some sort of system bounds that say, you know, don't propagate these pieces outside of this system bound, but propagate like these blessed pieces that like somebody's actually gone and gotten buy-in from like, you know, the most concerned team that that stuff's okay is, is probably necessary, at least at, you know, really large scale. So. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think this like it connects back to the you can have a really flexible API, but you also want something mm -hmm. higher level and very restrictive that most users interact with. And in this case, there are a bunch of like very subtle questions around the propagation of like, you know, a you may have some session ID that's propagating over multiple individual um, dub 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 requests, um, but each dub 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 request should have its own ID and like making sure users understand like what are the boundaries where things cross over and are able to do it in a safe way. Um, I think like we're, it's a very, very open question on our side of like how to make that work. Yeah, the boundary issue is just pernicious for any form of context propagation. The yeah. Big, big missing piece of the internet right now. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Michael, can you elaborate on the rate limiting? You said you do it uh, after sampling. So what happens to the trace if you start rate limiting? Yeah, so, so the way we're planning on doing rate limiting is um, we're planning on still doing it at trace start and not killing traces that are in progress. So like, for instance, like, you know, from the point of view, let's say that you're an individual node and you know you have a one in a thousand coin flip, right? Um, but when we configured that coin flip, we had like two nodes running. And then for some reason, now there's a thousand running. Um, what would happen is you do the coin flip, the coin flip would pass, and then there'd be a, an additional rate limit check. And we would have a set of centrally configured rate limits that say essentially, okay, this, you know, this, this policy gets to start five traces per second. It would check the rate limit after that, and the rate limit would then fail. Um, and that's also where it would check the trace size rate limit, right? So, so we're only going to do it at start. Uh, we don't want to try to get it, you know, we're not going to try to get into like, hey, could we somehow like kill, you know, a, a, a trace that's too big halfway through because that's just, you know. No, you do. Yeah. Processing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that all. So uh, does that answer the question? <clears throat> yeah. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I mean, we, we've done something similar, but not for regular sampling, but for like specific bug level sampling that people were abusing. Um, so we rate limit those, but for the, the reason we didn't do it for the, the regular sampling is because we extract some extrapolations from, from the statistics we get from overall traces. And, uh, and there, the probability of sampling actually very important. So if you start rate limiting it, you cannot do extrapolations anymore. Yeah. Um, so, Yeah, it, that, that's something we'd have to watch out for because we do it, we do it and, and we do that sort of thing in some cases as well. Um, you know, the, the intent of the rate limits is just for sort of our own safety. Like we don't mean, we don't intend them to be things that are going to be hit under like normal operation, you know? So, the, and, and we're, and we're going to monitor them, right? We'll have monitoring on them. If somebody like hits them in, in that sort of situation, we'll let them know. Right. Um, but, but yeah, it's just sort of something that, you know, we, we sort of can't get away with anymore and continue to onboard uh, people without yeah. being kind of, uh, skittish. They're so. kind of good for like a new use case where when, when you have, if we want to have like, when we're exposed to like dozens or hundreds of teams, we can't manually go in and understand like what their limits are going to be for maybe volume of data or number of traces or there are like their requests per second or all of this and they might not even know. So like there's just so much overhead in this space that if we can for the start case have like a same bound for here's the amount of traces you can get or the amount of data you can send us. Like our system doesn't have to fall over and they can iterate on that. Um, and then they can kind of move quickly without us. And it's also good for the case of maybe not the, the, new, the new whole tracing scenario case, but maybe I have this distributor request and somewhere in that request, we can't continue on because it didn't have instrumentation or something like that. And now maybe it's like a huge, like a service that everyone hits, 
and they want to add a ton of like instrumentation and now their service has 10x the amount of data pumping out than it was before and this gives us like a good way of understanding oh crap maybe sampling was the same but the size of all these traces just went up significantly and we need to have a quick pushback mechanism so our service doesn't fall over um so it's usually like those are the scenarios where it's like allowing us to move like quicker and not fall over uh, and then come and react to it and then have someone be like okay what do we do how do we do this properly yeah um one of our our uh, one who isn't here right now he's he was working on more of a sampling based approach where we dynamically changed the rates based on how much they're outputting i mean we have both as yuri said because of the debug override that we allowed in the system so like we still need that case but yeah i mean the changing the probability is a nice way of doing it if it, if you can, it seems like it's pretty static right now. Yeah, it should that's, take that's into right. consideration like size. Like, does that matter? Like, because probability will be, it depends on like what you care about, right? Like, if it's not, if all your traces are the same size, like. Oh, yeah, size is an interesting point. We haven't done that, but we've seen it definitely. Yeah, that's a big, like, yeah. we started with like number and we're actually transitioning more to size because our palettes tend to be on, or size is, a, is more, is a better indicator. We have such diversity in what traces look like, yeah. and especially when you're in, when you're not doing the case where it's a new tracing scenario, but updating an existing one that just a ton of like an updating an existing service that a ton of people hit. It's really hard to understand. Like, is this going to make us fall over immediately? So we might have someone who's like fifty percent of all of our traces, but they're only like one percent of all of our data. But if they were to increase their data significantly, like we might just fall over immediately, and they might not understand that. We don't have a good pushback mechanism for that. Yeah, are you doing the dynamic uh, sampling just by propagating the sampling rates through uh, the baggage? Oh, actually, we have like um, we have like a remote sampler. It's it queries basically on a minute by minute basis. I think so. It's like we the ingest side is sort of calculating the throughput from multiple areas and figuring out a good strategy of uh, probability there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, it definitely adds complexity. I mean, I didn't write it, so. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. Um, Sorry, Facebook yeah. has something similar where um, we'll like get a constant uh, volume of traces and we'll adjust the sampling rate accordingly um, with some feedback mechanism mm -hmm. like running every couple of minutes. Um, and that sort of has the same like, you know, there are, there are challenges with it. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to fine tune. Uh, well, the main challenge is that there are some uh, workloads which are periodical. And so when they're quiet, their probability kind of climbs up because there's nothing coming and then suddenly, boom, they flood you. Uh, yeah, we've gotten hammered with things like that, particularly around like aggressive rollouts too, where somebody has like a high rate during testing and then it gets rolled to production and there's like, four to seven minutes that are not fun and then yeah. the abilities adjust <laughs> right i think we're out of time yeah yep. that was that uh thank you so much uh jonathan and michael that was a great presentation Thanks. uh we'll be posting that on the internet uh and see you all next time the internet, <laughs> <laughs> the internet. thank you we will be propagating it. Yes. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, see you all later. It's been fun. Adios. Catch you later.